will kick those tires and start that galactic fire, for we are indeed camping interstellarly tonight. My guest, of course, is the star of the non-existent series, Weir Science, but I just made that up now, so he's going to enjoy it. With me is a very gifted author and someone who has that rare quality of having been bestowed with both hands by God, of being both very funny and knows what he's talking about. Now, I thought for years I was the only one who fit that mold, but then I was reminded that I actually don't know what I'm talking about. So it is my privilege and esteemed honor to welcome someone who actually does know a thing or two. He is an incredible author, and he wrote some niche little book called The Martian, which of course, took Matt Damon to save. Um, no one had heard about, and uh, he's somewhat, for some reason, available and here with us today. So, please welcome to the program, Andy Weir. I was told I'd get a sandwich. Uh, no, you won't get a sandwich, but that is a great segue. And there a was reminder. a sandwich voucher, maybe a, sa a sandwich sandwich. Well, we don't have a sandwich sponsor yet, so Subway. Mm -hmm. Hey, we're waiting for you. Five dollar foot long on Mars. But um, we do want, of course, thank our special sponsor, Keto Crisp. So. Whether you find yourself on a desert island in the middle of an urban city or perhaps stranded on Mars, of course, you can turn to the delicious, wholesome ingredients and balanced macronutrient profiles of Keto Crisp. Matt, that is for you. I'm interviewing your hero today. This bump, beep, beep. Those who've read it, they know what they're talking about. Just so. my bump. That's right. So go to Can Do Foods and enter promo code Went Camping for 25% off your galactic journey to better health. That was great. Okay. Nice. Um, I know we got got to do that for the, nice. for the Cater, catering the ad directly to the, yeah, it's good. Good That's job. Right. Honestly, good Keto Crisp, they are great. If you now I, so I'm curious you in your Wikipedia article, which of course is canon at this point, right? I mean, scripture essentially about you. Um, yes. Wikipedia is <laughs> never wrong. Uh, yeah. Never wrong. Uh, anything with wiki in it is generally good for most things. Right. So, right. Um, so it, it, it famously states that you have an aversion to flying you and John Madden. Yeah. Um, both were famous non flyers. Um, I'm curious, what is that? If you don't mind me asking, what is that rooted in? And then are we still no flying? Cause I know a lot of people who've flown like spirit airlines and then subsequently developed that, uh, same, <laughs> same aversion. Well, um, I've had a lifelong struggle with anxiety, all jokes aside, like I really have. And um, so uh, one of the ways it manifests is this crippling fear of flying. Um, logically, I know that it's the safest form of transport and that like, I'm not going to die in a plane crash, or at least it's catastrophically unlikely. But my fears and anxieties aren't interested in logic. Um, I got uh, medication, you know, the long-term anti-anxiety medication that helped me out a lot. Um, takes a while to kick in, but once it started working, it wasn't like magically I'm not anxious anymore. It's just less so. And things that used to really get me all uptight now only annoy me. You know, it's so that was part of it. And also just popping volume like Fez. That's what gets me on planes. Um, my doctor. So you, do, you do travel now. I do. Yeah, I will fly now, but I have to be sedated. And so, um, like my doctor and I, she just kept giving me, she said, try this. And, you know, I'm like, that's that, not even close, not even close to enough. Like I, I can take, so she'd give me, she'd be like, try this medication. She'd give me some medication. I'd take it. And then I'd just sit in my living room and I'd be like, nope, still really, really anxious, even just sitting here. So we just kept escalating and escalating and escalating until finally it just got the, she's like, yeah, screw it, Valium. And she's like, that, that'll absolutely take care of it for you. And it does. It basically makes me go night, night. And um, that's, how I, that's how I like to fly. <laughs> wow. Okay. So basically, you're like the flight in Inception where you need that cabin isolated, hook you up. We can actually go into your brain and find out your, your next best-selling novel. Uh, I'm assuming you can fly coach then if you're knocked out, right? Uh, I could, but I usually, actually, I usually fly uh, first class because I'm old and I have a lot of money and my back hurts and all sorts of stuff. Also, it's a little easier to just zonk out and fall asleep in the larger seats. That is true. That is true. I, um, I used and to I get to board first, which is also important because, you know, volume takes about half an hour to kick in. So I take it about half an hour before boarding. So by the time I get on the plane, I'm just like, uh... <laughs> I don't know if you're a modern family fan, but there was a great episode uh, with, uh, um cam and mitch and they took their sleeping pills and then they got delayed and so they had to come off the flight 
they were like ready and they got woken up to go back and they fell asleep out in the airport and they're just like still conked out on there. So I understand timing has got to be uh, pretty critical there, but I'm, I'm glad you're flying because I read in there again in the, in the lore of Wikipedia that uh, you didn't get to go to Budapest uh, for uh, filming of the Martian, but uh, for Hail Mary project, you'll definitely be there, but that one's actually yeah. in space. That one's filmed on location, <laughs> filmed right? on location. Right. <laughs> um, no, uh, yeah, they I they invited me out to Budapest where they were Budapest and Wadi Rum, which is in Jordan, where they were shooting the Martian. But yeah, I just I I couldn't handle flying that. I had worked out the magic formula. The magic formula is Valium. Okay, that's a we'd like stuff. to th- and we'd like to thank our ho- our, our sponsor Pfizer or whatever. No, don't don't volume, mention whatever. Pfizer on here. We will be, we will oh. be flagged as misinform. I can't see now. It's in the transcript. YouTube has already flagged this as well. They did they clip that out. I mean, COVID, COVID misinformation. COVID uh, misinformation. <laughs> I uh, well, I, well, I appreciate the the candor and the because uh, I know anxiety through the pandemic too has just been skyrocketing. And this is something you, so you wrestled with this for a long time. I'm curious. Yeah, a lot of people only only recently came to anxiety. I was born to it. I was molded you're OG. by it. You're, you're like, I was, uh, you're like Bane. You're I like, you was think born to anxiety. You only adopted it. <laughs> uh, to speak like Bane, I'd have to go. <laughs> Alan Tudyk, best Bane. Oh my gosh. That's a, so you're an OG. So proud. Uh, you're like a proud anxiety OG. Um, did you Don't find. Know, not uh, proud. <laughs> did did pandemic exasperate that? And then I'm curious about how success, um, because you know I have anxiety sometimes. Like when I was, you know, when I create uh, f- getting feedback from my friends on something, right? So I can't I imagine think that's yeah. normal. I mean, okay. <laughs> no, so you put out a novel that's now. I mean, I'm be, like, surprised by you the have world, friends, you know? but I mean, no, I uh, know. I mean, there's normally. I mean, being nervous about stuff like that—that's normal. That's normal human behavior. Anxiety is really when it's life limiting, when you're, when you're missing out on things because of irrational fears, you mm-hmm. know. And I was, I was missing out on a whole world that I couldn't access because it was too far away. Mm. So that's why I, and I, I urge anybody who feels like they're suffering from anxiety to get help. Um, uh, I, I spent my whole life just thinking, well, I'm broken. That's how it is. What are you going to do? But I mean. You you can get help. You <laughs> like they they've got pretty good pills now, and oftentimes it's just a chemical issue that can be fixed or at least greatly ameliorated. And um, you can you can be happier or or happier at least. And uh, it it's it's like if you broke your leg, you wouldn't feel bad about going to the doctor. But for some reason, if people have like a psychological issue, they feel like oh it's it's bad of me to go to the doctor for that. But mm-hmm. it's not. No, absolutely. Well, I appreciate it. that's that's cool, man. I appreciate the honesty and the vulnerability there. Um, oh. um I so uh, wait, wait. Am I gonna am I gonna score? Is that what's happening here? I mean, Are well, we, I mean, I think we need to talk a little. We, for, I guess we should give an obligatory <laughs> mention of this book because um, I know the the main thing people are curious about is the follow up. You and I texted about this briefly. Is the follow up to the Martian, the Venusian, uh, about the blind designer, uh, the blind, Venetian, blind, the Venetian, <laughs> the blind, the Venetian, the Venetian, yes. the, the blinds designer, and how that was yeah. some, for some reason canned. Um, yeah, uh, the publisher just wasn't interested. It was going to be just all about a guy who makes Venetian blinds and like page after page after page of detailed technical specifications and ex- explanations of exactly how Venetian blinds work. Maybe I'd delve into the history a bit. Anyway, they said I should probably stick to the space stuff. Yeah. And I try to compromise like about like a guy who installs Venetian blinds in space, but they didn't, they didn't go for that either. I don't know. All right. Well, we it's all not- about marketability, you know, it's, it's that's right. And then, sad. I mean, one thing about you I found interesting too is that you wrote this short story called The Egg, which of course, you know, was originally a recipe book and all about the different ways that one can <laughs> prepare. Uh, and then I actually read what The Egg really was. And I went, this is mind blowing. I'm like, wait, there's you and then there's God as me. And I'm going, this is uh, the way Wikipedia explained it. Basically, my mind uh, blew up. So, uh, but that's. You read. Uh, the Wikipedia, there's a Wikipedia article on the egg. Yeah, I'm here to. Yeah, I, oh, yeah, you got to check it out because that's is- where because the egg, the whole story is like a thousand words long. So yeah. the Wikipedia article is probably longer than the story. <laughs> I know. 
So I do want to go back. So obviously, you know, let's go back because we need to go. This is how far back Andy Weir goes, right? So he worked on a game. I am old. Called Warcraft. Okay. Now yeah. Warcraft for Warcraft those two actually Warcraft two. I know. So yeah, Warcraft. You know, do you remember the uh, I built a flying machine? Or uh, I built a flying machine. <laughs> or yes. What? What do you want? <laughs> okay. Join the army. They said. Or my favorite. See the world. Like, they said. We're under attack. So yeah. <laughs> oh man, Blizzard. Also yeah, so. the peons. More work. <laughs> work, work. All right. Okay. We're gonna have to come back. Weren't there? There were some great games. I mean, Diablo and StarCraft and the original Warcraft. So they were. That was awesome. Oh, they they made great games. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was so fun. Um, so all right, I want to go back because we do. We should probably, I guess, talk about your writing career briefly, since that's ostensibly, yeah. ostensibly why you're here. T but, touch on it, maybe. So you were writing for a much long, like many other writers, writing for a much longer period than prior to your commercial success with it. But was writing always just a personal passion? And you said, you know what? Like, if I make it great, if I don't, this is just something I love to do. And I'm actually curious if it was also a part of an outlet for any of your anxiety as well. Like, did you like writing as a controlled environment where you could kind of, I'm curious if that at all bled into it. Well, mainly I did writing for the Poontang, like <laughs> most people. No. Um, so I always wanted to be a writer, even when I was a little kid. Like, I mean, when I was a teen, when I was a tween and a teen, I was writing short stories, bad ones, but you know. And then uh, when it was time to go to college, I had to decide between writing and software engineering. Both were things that were interesting to me. Equally uh, lucrative. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I decided I wanted regular meals, so I went for software engineering. But I always still wanted to be a writer. And so um, I apologize for my camera shake. I'm, I'm literally, my, my computer is on a card table. Like a no, little... it's, very, it's very Blair Witch for my listeners. Yes, who there we go. Is, oh, you know? I, like it. I still like the, uh, what is it, that family guy where Brian is, you know, a seeing eye dog for people and he's describing what's going on <laughs> in a movie. And it's like the Blair Witch Project. He's like, nothing's happening, nothing's happening, something about a map. Nothing's happening. <laughs> I but anyway, I apologize for the uh, camera shake. There's not a lot I can do about it. It's a rickety card table. I promise you it's not a big deal. Trust me, if they don't like this episode, it's not because of that. Um, <laughs> so you're good there. So anyway, so you wanted regular um, meals. So you opted yeah, for right. software um, engineering. So I, so I, yeah, uh, but I always wanted to write. And so I was always writing in the background. Um uh, my first full-length novel was so terrible that I never even tried to get it published. Like, if the author knows it's bad, it's pretty bad, right? And then um, when I got laid off of AOL in 1999, I think. That's called America Online for my listeners. America <laughs> Online, yes. When they merged got with, mail. <laughs> when they merged with Netscape, which kind of shows oh, Netscape you Navigator. when that happened. Netscape also, Navigator. Also, the original browser uh one yep. of them that's right one of them yeah um netscape navigator when when aol merged with netscape they laid off uh me and 850 other people so um you know i didn't take it personally uh but uh i ended up with a bunch of money in the form of stock options that were like okay you have to sell these or lose them you know so i sold them and that turned out to be aol's peak stock ever throughout all time their highest I would not have made a wise stock market decision if I'd been given any choice in the matter, but it ended up working out well. So I ended up with enough money that I could go a few years without having to work at all. And I said, all right, I'm going to write a book. And so I did. I, I wrote a book. It wasn't The Martian. Uh, <laughs> it was called Theft of Pride. Um, I thought you say it's The Egg. You spent three years writing it. Egg. <laughs> three years. <laughs> Hard work. <-boiled don't> <laughs> this, this week, I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to get another word in there. <laughs> But um, yeah, and then I had the standard tale of low that every author experiences where I couldn't get anyone interested in the book. I couldn't get an agent, couldn't get, you know, anything. And so after, after a few years of that, I said like, well, I tried and I'll go back to writing. I'm sorry, go back to being an engineer. Now you did and nothing that, else during this period. You just wrote, you didn't take any other jobs, no odd jobs or anything. That's or? correct. Yeah. I was just, uh, just trying to write. Although of course there was an awful lot of laying around and goofing off and stuff as well. You know, that's part of the uh, writers, the writer's that's process. Part of, yeah. It's part of it. It's part of it. Part of, part of the process process. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so I, um, you know, I couldn't, couldn't break in. So I gave up and went back to engineering, but this wasn't a sad Charlie Brown music kind of situation. I, I like being an engineer. I like that job. I, I like the work. I like the team aspect of it all. It's 
it's cool. And I, I always enjoyed that job. So I just went back to work, but I was like, I still like writing. So I kept writing and um, I would just write things and post on my website. And that's where the Martian came from. It was originally like I'd been posting it to my website a chapter at a time. It was just a serial and that it took off. <laughs> no pun intended. Um, oh. I like that, huh? Um, so, so I'm curious. So when you, when I'm you, a dad now, so I get to tell dad jokes. Oh, that's, oh, that's so, awesome. Uh, Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. Thank that's you. Right. Thank this you. is a recent thing, right? Yeah. Uh, my baby is uh, 14 months old now. Um, I mean, that is indirectly why I'm talking to you from a card table, you know, because <laughs> we had the baby, so our house was too small, so we moved. Now we're in a new house, but we're remodeling the kitchen, so we're hiding at grandma's house right now while I'm, you know, while while our house is being torn up and et cetera. And remodeled to look like the uh, plastic wrap uh, set of the yes. Martian, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, my wife said no okay. on that one. Um, yeah. So no, it's just uh, it's a kitchen remodel though. So the whole thing's all torn out. There's dust everywhere, and we have a baby. So we're at well. Well, when I say grandma's house, of course, I mean the baby's grandma. <laughs> well, I feel like that's great for peace of mind is having a child. Right? So, yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's been it's been very it's been a very chaotic time. <laughs> oh man. Well, can't wait to see your kids old enough to go. Man, my dad wrote The Martian, and and honestly, again, I oh come on, kids are never impressed by well, one like. No matter, he's a boy, right? He's a boy. So until he's about like 12 or so, I'm just going to be the most awesome person on earth. Far enough, That's like no matter what. And then I'm going to be the most irredeemable dork on the planet. Like, But you're Andy Weir. You don't write stuff about this planet. You will but be it out. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I'm just going to be just a hopeless dork. Then maybe when he's 25 or so, I'll start to get smart again. Well, I can't wait till you help him with his science projects when it's like, dude, they More also, it could that. actually go both ways though. Cause like the teacher could have really high expectations. Like the <laughs> volcano with vinegar and baking soda is not going to cut not it gonna cut for it. Andy Weir's uh, kid. So I want to um, see a working reactor or yeah. get an F. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want you to grow potatoes with fertilizer, you know, with fertilizer, with your fertilizer, your fertilizer. Um, but uh, so when you conceived of the Martian, was it, did you have any idea of what it was to become, you were publishing it uh, chapter time. And I'm actually curious if you could set the table for what self-publishing was like at that time, uh, since this is sort of the Paleozoic era. Uh, yes. If I recall. Yeah. Um, back then. So once I finished chiseling the book, um, <laughs> uh, well, this was, this was, you know, uh, so basically I had been self-publishing it to my own website, which was just like the Soviet tractor factory equivalent of a website. It's just like, <laughs> it was like, I wrote the HTML myself in notepad, right? It was just, you know, white background with black text. And, and what year was this? Uh, this would be about 2009 is when I started. Okay. When I started the, the started writing the Martian, I'd been writing other things before that, but, um, uh, yeah, and so I, I finished it. I, you know, I wrote it a chapter at a time. It took me three years to finish it, and then when I posted the last chapter, I was like, "There we go, I'm done. I'm going to move on to another book and you know another another project." How did people find and, your website? And like, I mean, so you had this sort of Craigslist, you know, <laughs> you know, comparable site, and then did you just like say, "Hey, friends and family," or did you go to like science fiction, you know, areas? How, how did people find the? I didn't make any attempt to market. Um, basically, uh, before I started posting narrative fiction online, I uh, was making a web comic called Casey and Andy, which was a silly, you know, gag a day web comic, and that had about fifty thousand regular readers that I built up. Oh wow! And then yeah, and then uh, so I had a mailing list for that, and then I also started narrative fiction. So I ended up getting a small percentage of them over to my narrative fiction side, and so. All in all, I had about 3,500 regular readers by the time I was writing The Martian. And that sounds impressive, but stops being impressive when you realize it took me about 10 years of posting content, <laughs> literally about 10 years of posting content before I accumulated that many readers. So I had this slow buildup of readers. Um, anyway, once I finished The Martian, um, I got emails, people saying, hey, I, I love this story, but I hate your website. Your website is crap, you're garbage, and you should feel bad. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. And they said, well, you know, e-readers are sort of a thing now. Can can you just post it in a format that I can get in an e-reader? And I'm like, sure. So I figured out how to do that. I posted posted, you know, an EPUB and at the time, Moby 
which was another format that people used that I think is dead now. I'm not sure. But anyway, so I put it in some e-reader formats and said, there you go. Then other people emailed and said, like, hey, I'm not very technically savvy. I don't know how to, like, download a thing from the Internet and put it onto my Kindle. Can you just put it up on Amazon somehow so I can get it through their system? It's like, all right, let's see how that works. Well, Amazon has this whole, um, you know, self-pubbing system set up, Kindle, Kindle Direct Publishing, KDP. It's pretty good. I mean, they, they take, you, you get 35% of your cover price. They take the rest. Other than that, that's, that's it. Which is infinitely more than the traditional publishing model. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. well, when, when you're getting zero, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And so it, I, I went ahead and said like, yeah, sure. I'll do that. I posted it. And so then I told my readers, okay, you can, uh, Read it for free on my website, or you can download it for free from my website, or you can pay Amazon 99 cents to put it on your Kindle for you. Because one other thing is you're not allowed to give it away. On on Kindle, you're not yeah. allowed to self-pub for free. They, they actually lose money on every Kindle they make. It costs them more money to make a Kindle than it costs you to buy one. Interesting. Um, but, but they know that they're going to make money because you'll be buying um, books. To the read Venetian, on it. the Venetian and the, the Venetian and 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 the and the yeah the Louvre and and so on, um, but so it's actually a loss leader. So to keep that from being a straight up loss, they say like, okay, no one's allowed to give away books on Kindle. You have got to charge for them. So we get our cut. So I charged ninety nine cents, which was the minimum they allowed, and I said, all right. So there we go. And people just started buying it. Um, it 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 sold like crazy. Um, I think part of the reason is because it was only 99 cents <laughs> and it got around by word of mouth. It's one of those things that you can't really do on purpose. You just get lucky and it happens. It took off. Wow. That's awesome. And so you had no idea it was going to happen and then it took off. And, and then was the, did you actually make enough from the Kindle sales to finance your life? No, 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 okay. not at all. Um, I, I, yeah, no way. <laughs> so you're getting tw but, 25 cents per or per. 35 just about 35 cents per copy sold. I yeah. sold about 35,000 copies um you know by the I don't know within like 6 months or so, something like that. So about the and price of your COVID stimulus check you got. So. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, something <laughs> like that. But um but I'm trying to think uh yeah, then I was approached by a traditional publisher. And it wasn't until I got that traditional publishing deal. And in fact, the film deal was already in place by the time I quit my job. Like I said, I really liked being a programmer. I wasn't in any hurry to leave. I liked the job I had, too. When I, uh, when I did resign, it was because I needed to take all my time to start working on my next book because that was now my primary source of income. Um, but it, it was not a take this job and shove it kind of thing. It was like, oh, I'm going to miss you guys. I was a happy little cubicle dweller. There you go. You so you were the guy in office space, basically. Uh, no, that guy was really unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, right? yeah, yeah. Well, there's Milton. Milton liked his job, remember, with his yeah, stapler. <laughs> yeah. Well, he he set fire to the building. That's true. I guess that's sort of the one, like, sort of you know, blemish on his otherwise stellar, <laughs> stellar <laughs> track record. I mean, this this may affect your performance review. That's right. Um, <laughs> All right, so Martian gets optioned, and you're were you like, oh my gosh, this is gonna happen? This is gonna be a movie, or had you had you inculcated the healthy skepticism of Hollywood at this point? M massive healthy skepticism. Like, okay, at the time it said like, oh, Fox wants the film rights, and my agent said, okay, well, we'll we'll transfer for that over to CAA. I had an agent there. CAA it still have him. John Casier is his name. Good guy. Um, he's still my film agent. And, uh, you know, John said, hey, here you go. I've got you this deal, but don't get excited. Any book that's even remotely successful yeah. ends up like they, you know, the Instantly studios, option. <laughs> yeah, the studios buy the option. And this conversation them, right now is being optioned right now. Probably <laughs> being optioned. Yeah. That's right. I've and, already and, sold the rights and we haven't even released this yet. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, and, and so, so he said like, yeah, don't get excited, but just enjoy the money, you know? You get you get a little bump. It's not huge, but it's like just for the option. You get the big money when they if they actually make the film. But he said like they're never you know they're not going to make this probably. But just you know enjoy the money. And in a year and a half, the option will expire. The rights will come back to you, and you can sell the option again. And a lot of writers just 
cycle their books options yeah and and make money that way just a regular stream of income which i think is awesome good for them so the larger your back catalog of books the more of these option yeah. cycles you have going and so that's cool and i'm like all right that's cool great and that but then they made the movie <laughs> you know, and they ruined it all for you. No, no. Then, then now I don't get to resell the options. Oh. Do you remember no, so what happened to make it kind of, uh, you know, go from fantasy to like this? Like, was there a cut? Was there one or two things that you're like, they actually, this led to this thing happening? Because I'm in the entertainment industry and I know how it, every time a movie is made, it's like an angel gets its wings. It is unbelievably right. rare. And an, it's an yeah. astonishment to me that a film gets made. Sometimes yeah. even when you have all the right people, the big name, I mean, it just, it's amazing. It doesn't so, necessarily happen. Yeah. How did The Martian get made? Well, um, part of it is, uh, I, I think I owe most of it to a producer named Aditya Sood, who um, really thought it was a good property and said, this movie, this if this was a movie, it would make a whole bunch of money. And he, he convinced 20th Century Fox to like you 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 you've already optioned it now now actually make it happen let's let's get someone in there so we got um uh also right from the get go Drew Goddard um was interested he's um uh, he he wrote uh let's see he directed let's see, wait no yeah he directed Cabin in the Woods he wrote I think Cloverfield he's he's pretty prolific he was really interested in it. And so he wanted to write the screenplay and and then direct it, and so that that that's pretty cool. That that's pretty good. And so we talked, and and he he was really interested in doing that. So we had him on board, and then um, and then we got. I think maybe one of the biggest moments was when Matt Damon said he wanted to play the lead. That's when people started going like, okay, this is uh this is a pretty big deal now. And then we lost Drew to a um he went to go direct the next like uh spider-man film i think i've heard of and those. Yeah, yeah. yeah if you've heard of some of those so then we didn't have a director and then this kind of unknown art student guy ridley scott uh oh, popped yeah. in yeah, yeah that, that guy. guy yeah he okay. directed a commercial once that's right um, I, I remember and he had that movie um uh it was about the sort of extraterrestrial you know it was, I, like, was, it was it like et i think it was yeah, et it was probably et yeah it was et know? i think it was et yeah yeah for sure yeah. as your as your listeners are furiously <laughs> no i it's funny because alien i actually rewatched alien recently and it's funny because alien and, and i love the franchise but i look back as like there's really only two good movies to me in the yeah, entire franchise alien and aliens yeah right and like and the cool thing is they're two different genres right which is like yeah. alien to me and i'll probably get pushed by this but I think it's it's, it's my favorite, but it's top three. I think horror movie. Like it's it the sets are unreal. It's a great haunted house movie. Uh, it just it, it checks all the boxes. It has a Top Gun star, you know, Tom mm -hmm. Skerritt in it, which is of course one of my criteria for you know successful filmmaking. Uh, and Sigourney right. Weaver's. And but the thing about that, the monster is only on camera for I think like a couple minutes tops, if that, right? And that's what right. makes it so good. Aliens in their hand, just like awesome action like, movie. Oh yeah, action and flick. Bill Paxton's eternal performance. Game and, over, man. Game over, man. <laughs> you just got our asses kicked, man. <laughs> well, yeah. What's the line that says like, "Oh yeah, we're on an express elevator to hell. hell. Go wing down." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or start your grinning and drop your linen. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> Bill Paxton, miss you, man. That guy. What a rip legend. in peace, bro. What a what a legend. Um, but all right, so Ridley, you convinced Ridley Scott, there's a no name director to come on yeah. board, Matt Damon, and then they're like, and then I, the pitch meeting was like Matt Damon, Ridley Scott, and that Mars. was kind of it. Yeah. Well, no, at that point it was like then everybody wanted to be part of it. It started like you know steamrolling, and it really was a blessed production. You've heard of cursed productions. The Martian was the opposite of that. Like everything went right. Like wow. There, I mean, there was one, the only thing that went wrong was at one point Ridley got like the flu and they had to stop shooting for like three weeks. And I'm yeah. like, this dude's 80. Is he going to die? <laughs> no, I don't know. Probably not. But um, yeah. And then it just like, it finished ahead of schedule. You know, it was just like also everything unheard. went right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, it did, and it did well. Um, and yeah. And it did one, great. And yeah. one thing I love about your books, and I think it just, it has to be stated here is just that you 
you just you help people fall in love with science and uh, it's just and it's such a fine you know yeah and i just i mean the, the movie was uh, absolutely riveting and it's fine i like the martian i am more excited for hail mary i think hail mary well, is better than the martian and they're both amazing uh, but a lot of people hail- say that and that makes me feel good because that means i'm improving as a writer rather than spiraling down well, it's, it's so. not even yeah it's it's a subjective <laughs> but it's like the concept i don't want to spoil anything because one i did on audible which some people are like that's not reading a book and i was like first off it's i think it's a really cool first sec- off yeah, how dare you speak to me yeah <laughs> the, <laughs> yeah sec- i'm yeah but i was like the sound effects alone make it yeah pretty cool it's it's a cool auditory experience uh, they which did I, a fantastic job well uh, audible loves me they can't get enough of me and i uh, i love them i mean basically um Artemis is my like least selling book. It's a book between the Martian and Project Hail Mary that people kind of often forget exists. But the audiobook of Artemis was like the second or third best selling audiobook in Audible's history. Like they 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 marketed it, they, you know, had a big ad, you know, big marketing and advertising campaign for it. They had events for it. They had the celebrity narrator, of course, it was Rosario Dawson narrates it. Like she's the reader. And and so, I mean, they made a, a mint off of Artemis. And so when Project Hail Mary came around, they said, we want it. We'll give you a bunch of money, a great deal as an author, et cetera, et cetera. And then they said, like, we're going to spend a bunch of money marketing it. And, and, usually, and now it's like selling like crazy. So they really put the effort in to make it a really good production. Oh, they did. And it's fantastic. Yeah. I, anyone who's not listened to Hail Mary, probably, it's one of those audiobooks where I was like, I was in LA a lot when I was listen, listening to it. And I was very thankful to be stuck in traffic because I'm like, <laughs> I, I'd be like silencing calls. Can't talk right now. I'm like busy, you know, because I'm like, I need to find out what's happening. Question mark, fist bump, beep, beep. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> for those who, uh, oh man, I was, uh, yeah, there was, and oh man, I don't want to, I'm getting into plot details. I can't because there were some emotional <laughs> moments. And I was like, no. Uh, but everyone I know uh, just loved it. And it's such a, no, I actually have, it's part of my $50 book club challenge. There's, there's a few mm-hmm. books that I tell people, if you don't like this, I will give you $50. Um, and no one's ever taken me up on it. And Hail Mary's one of them. Like, it's just, <laughs> it's that fun. And you learn so much. So, which is a great question and segue into, you know, are you just recreationally into orbital physics and biology and also, and then, and then, you know, was that just part of your day to day studying that made these books kind of kind of natural for you? Because I know other I'm, authors, I mean, like, I got to study this. Oh, no, I had to. I mean, I had to do a bunch of research. Like, it's not like I just knew all this stuff off the top of my head. But I guess what makes me a little weird is I, I love it. Like, this stuff is really, really interesting to me. I love the research is my favorite part of writing a book. Like, you know, so doing all the research on the orbital dynamics and stuff for the Martian, all the lunar stuff for the Artemis, and then Project Hail Mary, again, not too much in the way of spoilers, but a lot of things about relativistic travel, stuff like that. Um, So uh, all that stuff, I just, I love it. I do it for fun. So, I mean, I think it's time people understand I come out of the closet. I am a nerd. (laughs) Breaking news! I will do the headlines. Breaking news! Yeah, Andy Weir no on one... Andy Weir on modest size podcast. He admits <laughs> likes science, right? Yeah, right. So. Andy Weir. This just in. Um, so I'm curious, uh, you know, in all the stuff you studied, what uh, two parts here? What has been the most fascinating thing, in your opinion, that you've learned? This is gonna be really tough to answer. I know in in space yeah. travel, and then I'd say, is there anything as far as future developments or things happening right now that you're very excited about when it comes to um, space and technology or physics or anything like that? I don't know. Uh, the most interesting thing to learn in terms of space travel, I mean, superlatives are always hard to answer. I know. Um, but I, I don't know. I guess a lot of people just don't understand the scale of space, even within our solar system. So let me just uh, give you some comparisons here. You know, people say like, well, we went to the moon, right? So Mars should be next, right? That, that makes sense. Well, just to put it into perspective, let's say you're on a football field, right? And you're at one goal line and Mars is at the other goal line. You know where the moon would be? No. It would be about, it would be about 10 centimeters in front of you. Wow. So that's the relative distances involved, right? And then, then you start talking about space and you're like, okay, well, I want you to imagine that our solar system, our entire solar system, from the sun in the middle to the orbit of Neptune, right? Which is now that 
now that uh you know neil degrasse tyson ruined pluto for everybody pluto um, was it for me pluto's out man you're out pluto it's like yeah. King of powers you're out you know what pluto says pluto says i was big enough for your mom anyway um <laughs> that is the most that is the best convergence of nerd and inappropriate humor i mean that's fantastic well, side note just a brief side note um I was uh, I was I was on Star Talk. I've been on Star Talk several times. The Neil deGrasse Tyson's show. I I mean it's it's not as cool as your show, but uh, you know I have been on it. Neil, and, um, Neil someone. I mean yeah. Neil Neil Grassy something. Anyway, Neil Diamond I think it's would have been impressive. Degrassi, but, yeah. Degrassi High School. Anyway, <laughs> um, uh, anyway, I was on his show and we were live and everything like that. And uh, I I said like you know what's weird, Neil, is that there's like you know in Disney there's 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 Goofy, right? Who's like a dog, and but he walks and he talks to people, and you know, just like Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse. But then there's Pluto, who is a dog. Dog. He has a dog house. He doesn't know how to talk. He eats like a bone and stuff like that. So, but Goofy and Pluto are the same species, right? But one of them's like a sapient member of society, and the other one is a pet. Oh, yeah, so, totally. Yeah. So I said, like, so maybe, maybe, maybe they're not really the same species. So what do you what do you think? Maybe Pluto is not a dog. <laughs> so he just said, "Oh, that's so this big eye roll." Anyway, so getting back to that next little tidbit, I wanted to point out is um, when uh, so so we, we've talked about the difference in between like how close the moon is versus how close Mars is. Well, the next one is um, if you take our entire solar system and shrunk it down to be the size of a quarter. So. A quarter is, you know, our sun's in the middle and the orbit of Neptune is just the perimeter of the quarter. The Milky Way galaxy, the galaxy that we live in, would be about the size of the United States. So it's just insane how big things are. <laughs> and then our galaxy is just one of a bunch of galaxies in our cluster. And our cluster is just one of a bunch of clusters in a supercluster <laughs> and so on. I want to put like flashing text, pause for reflection. <laughs> Just like, yes. I mean, so, all right. So the vastness of space, this is something I wanted to ask you about. I mean, because it is to quote Jodie Foster, you know, in contact, great movie. Um, he's like, you know, if we alone out there, she's like, well, if not, it'd be an awfully big waste of space. Right. So um, <laughs> once again, referring back to the canon of scripture as Wikipedia, um, from which all mm -hmm. truth flows about you. Um, mm -hmm. It says that you're, you know, openly agnostic. Um, and I'm curious, you know, I mean, that's what, not like a, that's not like a proselytizing religion. <laughs> I know it's like, oh, he's a practicing agnostic, you know, I'm a practicing agnostic. Yeah. But I'm curious because I, and you know, to mention Blake, who, um, you know, obviously uh, we'll we'll get to making fun of him uh, as my last interview. Uh, yeah. But um, <laughs> you know, when you look at the universe and having studied so much and just the the scientific constants that we see, you know, even in this vastness of space, etc. Uh, one thing that like always just struck me as odd and i know you know just because something seems to be a coincidence doesn't mean it is right but like even just the fact that we can get solar eclipse uh on this um on this planet right that because the sun is 400 times bigger than the moon yeah. but is 400 times further away it's like that's so interesting that that just happens to be a coincidence in which we can base like chronology and time and like and it only happens on this one planet that happens to have like you know, just the perfect calibration for life, which I think whether you're religious or not, uh, a lot of science will say, yeah, the, I mean, the earth is just, it's it's a practice of a lot of- Very random, unique. You know, yeah. yeah, unique setup in there. So when you look and you and you study this and all this research of the universe, I mean, do you, do you see evidence for anything more than, you know, just random coincidence? I mean, so basically, like, like you said, I'm an agnostic. So my general answer to that is always just like, as an agnostic, I'm the one religion guaranteed to be correct in that I don't know. That's my claim. And it's true. Like, I, I don't know. And I can prove to you, I don't know. See, ask me, ask me about God. I don't know. See, proof. So, um, <laughs> however, I, I, I mean, I, this is completely out of my wheelhouse religion, but I would say that if there is some sort of divine being or a creator or something like that, um, that entity would be um, kind of too far beyond our ability to comprehend. And so it's unlikely that we'd be able to, you know, easily spot and prove or disprove its existence, right? So it's like, you know, an anthill next to a superhighway 
the anthill doesn't understand what the superhighway is, what it's for, or even that it's just a very, very small part of an even larger, you know, enterprise that is so much more important to its creators than the ants ever were. I don't know. Um, I, I get a little, I don't know. I, I just start to shrug when I think about religion because it's like, it's, it's, kind of by definition not science right it is it is faith based right. and so it's it's based on things that you cannot tangibly prove yeah but by the same token i i don't like it i, I don't like it when people bash religion i don't i don't like i, I don't like anti-religious sentiment i consider it um you know when, when when people mock christians or any other faith i consider that to be as as petty and mean-spirited and socially unacceptable as when a religious person you know tells you you're going to go to hell or 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 whatever their version of it is and i i just say like you know that live and let live if if someone's not actually actively harming you in some way just like why why do you feel like it's your place to mock their belief system just leave them alone yeah no, I appreciate that. I think, yeah, I'm just, I'm just always curious, you know, it's when you have, I love asking people who by virtue of their research or their profession, just kind of engage with sort of the, the, the dynamics of, I mean, space to me is the ultimate uh, humbling experience. If you ever want to just grasp like how, and not small in a derogatory way, but just like a, no, yeah, a, a taking comfort and like, wow, like there is just, I mean, just to meditate on the vastness of space uh, makes me just really I mean, just kind of stand in awe and go, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I don't, I don't, I don't understand how all of this can just be chance. Cause there, and that we're still learning. I love too how much mystery there is too. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here too, because my, my, my quantum and my galactic uh, knowledge is uh, limited as is evidenced every day on the Everybody's show. quantum knowledge is limited. That's right. Well, some people, yeah, some, I mean, there are no, no, no. Who, yeah. I mean, literally quantum physics has like, you literally cannot know these two things at the same time. Anyway, go on. Well, what about 1984? Double think. I can do that. Double think. Know? I have, I have double thing. Two plus two is four and five. Yeah. Um, We've uh, always a, been at war with East Asia. A recession is two quarters of negative. Two quarters GDP negative. Growth, but it's but, also not. But it's also not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, exactly. Have a little shout out there. Uh, but uh, no, it's interesting when you're studying all that and you go, okay, there's, we, like, we still don't understand gravity fully. Right. I, I love not, interstellar. Not at all. Like, yeah. Yeah. And that's why yeah, we have no idea. <laughs> no, and I, and I love I love that there's still these great as much as the calibration makes sense to me. I go, man, they're just forces. Like I loved Interstellar only because of a attempt to visualize uh, relativity and time. Tra I mean, we're not talking, but like uh, the distance and the effects of gravity on intergalactic travel. And you're like, this is like, how can gravity affect time? This is like, yep, that's general relativity. And they had Kip Thorne, a Nobel laureate. Um, Try to help doing us out. Their math. <laughs> yeah, doing their math on that. I know. Well, I thought it was cool about the movie is they had an event horizon, you know, a theorized what lies beyond a black hole, which is sort of like the 30 minute mark at my show. No one's really gotten past it. So we don't really know what's. <laughs> <laughs> so on your show, anything, anything that that transcends beyond the 30 minute mark just becomes <laughs> an amorphous, um, unknowable part of the show. It, it's like, uh, so it's the uh, the yeah the event horizon the the short shield radius That's of right. your show is about thirty minutes. <laughs> I like to keep my episodes unreleased too, sort of like the black the cat in the box, because the second I release them, one of the realities is there, right? Yeah. So um, before you release it, it both sucks and doesn't suck. That's right. Once, Once I, you release, release it, it's going to collapse <laughs> into one of those two. <laughs> and which one we can you know theorize on? So I, I appreciate the twelve people who are going to love and appreciate uh, the, some of this humor today. So thank you. But <laughs> Kip's on their live streaming. Like I didn't do that. So um, 12 people. So you're, you're thinking half your audience is going to get this. That's right. I know, wow. That's right. Yeah, I know. Hey, this show is adored by literally dozens of people around yes. the world. Um, we, I, I, I used to say, I, I say like, I have ones and ones of fans. I'll have, you know, <laughs> actually, no, you know, it's funny. We had uh, our highest, one of our highest chartings uh, internationally recently. We were number 20 for comedy podcast in uh portugal so i said oh get out the porto and if i go there do i need security now but then in, right because you're in, a big shot in lithuania and finland i was down into the 150s so um well, but maybe they don't like to they're not ready for you yeah, they're, they're not, not ready. ready for you 
I was ahead of my time and behind it too. I've also been accused of both. <laughs> so, um, I've, both of those realities. Uh, as we uh, wind down here, mercifully, um, I'm, I, I do. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about your writing process because we have we make every author um, answer this question. But hmm. I'm curious. You love research, but what does a typical writing day look like for uh, Andy Weir? Um, uh, well, mostly I I. In a, in a typical day, I'll get I'll get up in the morning, have my breakfast and whatnot, and then I will um, just do work stuff that isn't writing until about midday, until I eat lunch. Basically, I'll 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 be answering emails, scheduling meetings, doing doing um, doing things like this. So, although at this point we're you know as of when we're recording this, it's about four o'clock my time, so that's a little anomalous for me. But um, usually I try to get my non-writing yet work-related things done by noon. Then after lunch is when I start writing. And I try to make a thousand words a day when I'm working on a first draft. And I have a bunch of artificial rules. I say like, oh, I can't do these various things that I enjoy until I've made my words. So like no form of video entertainment is allowed. Not allowed to watch TV, no YouTube, no streaming, nothing. Not allowed to do any woodworking or metalworking. Those are my hobbies. I love doing them. I don't let myself do them, you know, and so on. Um, and that's kind of how I try to eat out, um, you know, like a hundred words, a thousand rather words a day. That would be a typical day for me when I'm um, working on a first draft. Now, when I'm doing edits, all bets are off. First off, when I'm editing, my productivity is pretty good generally. So I don't need, I don't need um, kind of like artificial motivators to make me get my editing done. I'm excited at that point because I'm kind of like, okay, the end is in sight. I'm almost, this book is coming, coming together. It's, it's a lot easier to paint a house than to build a house, right? Um, and so that, yeah. And then there's a lot of back and forth with the editor and a lot of phone calls. I also end up spending a lot of my time in phone calls with Hollywood related stuff for film. You know, I'm always, I'm always one way or another find myself working on a TV show pitch or a film pitch or something like that. They never get picked up. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, this is how it works. This is how it is. Oh, and, me, yeah, me too. It's, yeah. it's and as far as and when you're in research, Blake, Blake knows all about that too. <laughs> oh, I know. That's right. It's that's although why they're I, making dark matter right now. Uh, and he sold upgrade to Spielberg, which is great. Um, cool. You know, and uh, he's uh, but you know he's still trying to monetize that book with his you know limited collection of uh, wayward pine cones NFTs. Yeah, wayward. You know? <laughs> so that's i get it authors are forced to try and monetize these ancillary revenue streams and it's uh we got to think how to productize the martian and uh, i was gonna ask if for breakfast you eat self-fertilized potatoes i do uh, not no okay, actually i do not <laughs> that is extremely not recommended that's right that's right <laughs> in I, general <laughs> that's right i appreciate that um all right and so when you um what advice would you give to uh writers right now i i would usually say young writers but i'm thinking Anyone who has the bug to write mm. uh, and is thinking this could be for them and they're thinking of abandoning their job at Blizzard, Microsoft. Right. Uh, right. What would you say? Um, well, I have three bits of advice for any would-be writer. Uh, number one is you have to actually write. I mean, that seems obvious, but when you're thinking about a story up in your head, it's just a daydream. You only find the problems when you actually start writing it down. The moment you start to write page one of your story, that's when you realize, oh, crap, this doesn't work. That doesn't work. How am I going to tell the reader all the stuff they need to know without being boring? That's when you're actually writing, the actual work of writing. You have to put words in your, in your word processor. Okay, So that's number one, is you have to actually write. Number two, and this is hard, you should resist the urge to tell your friends and family the story that you're working on. You can give them... Okay. You can give them the elevator pitch, but don't give them all the details. Don't tell them the story. Most authors are driven by a desire for other people to experience their story. If you tell your story to people, that kind of satisfies that desire, and it saps your will to actually write it. So make yourself a rule that says the only way anyone experiences a story is by reading it, even your closest friends. And then you can still give it to them a chapter at a time to get the sweet, sweet validation that you crave, but you can... you. You don't don't just verbally tell it to them. And the last bit of advice is there's never been a better time throughout all history uh, to self-publish than now. The old boy network between writers and readers is gone. You don't have to get anyone's approval to put a book out there for people to read. I definitely recommend trying to go the traditional route if you possibly can. But if you can't, then self-pub it. Take your chances. Wow. 
That's amazing. Well, now I'm not going to tell you my story because you're just going to have to read it. So there you uh, go. That's right. I'm going to make you read that. Uh, that's what's wonderful. Uh, what, this is a little bit of our lightning round here uh, to wrap up here. So uh, all right. what would you tell younger Andy advice? wise? Uh, it gets better. <laughs> like I, I, I had real problems with anxiety and depression when I was younger. I was like not really even a functional human being. I mean, I was I was a very unhappy person for most of my life and i just wish i could tell that earlier version of me hey man it gets it doesn't just get better it gets awesome <laughs> you know for me it's like hey you become a world-renowned writer you get married you have a kid just just stick hang in there you, you're, you're getting there That's right. well i was worried some people say oh i tell myself you're gonna get a call from this guy ryan one day whatever he's one day hang up. Whatever hang he says, up. just say no just hang, hang up. up that's right i mean i guess maybe i i you know i might warn my younger self about 9 11 <laughs> Yeah, fair. That's good. I mean, there's there's yeah. a lot of things you could do. <laughs> it's not, um, how did you? Uh, so you met your wife in L.A. Yeah. Uh, what was that meeting? Was it uh, love at first draft or uh, <laughs> what was that well, story? Um, we just uh, we we it's just it's kind of boring, but also cute. It's just like we met in a restaurant. We were both staying at the same hotel, and like uh, we were both eating, I, I think, dinner or something at the same time, and. We were sat in two tables for one, but they were like kind of near each other and we were facing each other the way they had seated us and we got to talking and that's how I met my wife. Oh, so it was, it was truly just you were both there by yourself? Yep. We were just, I was there for a business trip. She was there um, house hunting and uh, yeah. Which hotel it's, was it? So we can give a shout out for Mary. Nah, nah, nah. I, I don't want to go too deep into the into the personal stuff. I, I mean, that that's a special thing for my wife and me. Okay, great. Well, I was going to give the, the hotel a shout out, um, mm. but um, no, that's no awesome. shout out for them. And yeah, no, <laughs> there's no shout out for them. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But uh, and then last question, um, and if you don't have an answer for this, that's okay. Um, but uh, Blake even had an answer for this, so that's yeah, that's how. Oh, okay, okay. So you're going to make it a competition. That's okay. right. Uh, this is our Rod Serling uh, segment for Twilight Zone. Have you ever Imagine had... if you will. That's right. Imagine if you will. I'm here so... with Andy Weir going on 50 minutes and he's still talking. Um, <laughs> Submitted for your approval. What uh, is, have you ever had a, a sort of Twilight Zone or mysterious uh, coincidental moments in life that just kind of makes you go, ooh, that was a little spooky or that was, that was interesting? Um... Well, it's really, I mean, I can think of one off the top of my head, and it's just not even that interesting. Um, but one time back in the 80s, I was like, uh, just, <laughs> this could be such a letdown. I'm sorry. I'm going to apologize in advance. I, Don't worry, the entire the 80s, interview probably is going to be so <laughs> Yeah. So I was watching, I was, I had videotaped something in, in advance, and then I was watching it on, on the VCR. And um, it got to the end of the show. And then it started going into the commercial break and stuff like that. And so there was a commercial on, on the videotape that I was watching. I just pressed stop. And for those of you who aren't a million years old, uh, a VCR, when you press stop, will just go back to showing whatever's on whatever channel your TV was on. right? And it happened to be that same commercial in about that same moment. So I pressed stop. And then the VCR just stopped. And but the commercial kept playing. And I was like, the fuck is going on <laughs> ghost in the machine but, yeah so it's just by sheer coincidence i happen to be watching a commercial on a tape and when i stopped the tape that actual commercial was airing do you remember what the commercial was no I, I, it was like a law firm or something from the 80s oh then. bummer i was hoping it was like some like really poignant life advice you know yeah like the guy pointing at you you know and just like, like no andy you don't get to pause i'm telling you yeah that's so funny. no nothing um, nothing yeah Oh, man. Well, Andy, thank you so much. Um, Thanks for I, having me. I really appreciate you being here. And I'm so glad that the rumors are not true. You're actually quite engaging and fun. I know. Um, I know. I'm, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm really sad that the rumors about you aren't true. But... I know you convinced Gosling to somehow be involved in this. Now, have you thought through backups? Um, have we thought of, so we've, we've explored Gary Busey. We've explored. Gary um, Busey. Yeah, that, that, that'd be perfect. Uh, you know, Chris Tucker. <laughs> Uh, Chris Tucker would be you know, good. Yeah. Or actually, have you thought about Liam Neeson? You know, just like threatening <laughs> Rocky. 
<laughs> just turning around. I have a particular set of skills. Skills that make me a nightmare for Astrophage. If you leave now, that'll be the end of it. You know, <laughs> it's a shame he passed on. But I was Sean Connery would have been awesome in The Martian. I thought, you know, mm. I'm pretty much full. That's right. People forget the Red October was an intergalactic vessel able to make it all the way to Mars. My first enemy, of course, the United States. My second enemy, fertilizer and making potatoes. (laughs) That works. Good impression. Hey, thanks. Got to work it in there somehow. Anyways, we've been camping intergalactically with Andy Weir. If you have not checked out the Hail Mary Project, please do. It is absolutely worth a listen. It is so fun. And look for it on the big screen. And we will catch up with Andy Hopefully, never again. Thanks again, Never again. (laughs) Thanks for having me, man. Thanks for joining us, folks. If you want to help us out, and we're confident you do, go ahead and hit that subscribe button here on our YouTube channel. And if you ever feel like just listening to these, you can check us out on all major podcast streaming platforms.